So welcome, and today I'm in conversation with uh, Ashpini Mokashi, um, and we're going to talk about philosophical health and um, the practice of philosophical counseling, because I believe you have been uh, practicing for several years. Yes, yes, that's true. How did you decide to help people via philosophy? Where was the moment uh, that made you uh, jump in this strange activity? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, Louis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My pleasure. And, uh, thank you. It was, uh, I think I would just call it a serendipity. Um, you know, it was not planned as such, but the way it happened uh, was um, totally sort of, you know, by accident. And uh, I was I was still in um, I was still a student at the time. I was doing my master's in philosophy, and uh, I was invited to give a talk on Indian philosophy at a girls' detention center in Pune in India. And uh, when I went there, I talked to like you know a bunch of uh, uh, teenagers, like somewhere between eight to fifteen year olds. Um, there were quite a few of them, and I gave them uh, you know, some information about our ancient culture, Indian philosophy, and you know um, what our tradition is. And I asked them what they know about their tradition. And uh, in the process, I learned so much from them, a sort of whole world of their beliefs and their values and principles that I was completely, you know, otherwise ignorant of. And all this story they're completely negative they were not this is our tradition and we are proud of it but all the stories were like this is what you do and this is how life punishes you and they were obviously there because their parents or at least one of their parents was in jail and they were like you know trying to uh, sort of make sense of their life and uh, a lot of these children didn't have any other family to uh, uh, you know to rely back on as a support structure so they were uh, invited to stay there. So it was a very sad kind of situation. And I felt terrible about, you know, hearing all the stories. And I felt like if these, if these children are not taught, like, you know, anything that's good about our ancient philosophy, our culture, and how life can be viewed positively, then they're sunk because they're only going to see it as like sort of, you know, uh, as some form of punishment, and they're going to feel victimized all the time. So there, just at that moment, I started turning those stories around and I started saying to them, okay, let's let's try and see, you know, how we can view this story differently and why it's not goddess's punishment, but it could be a blessing and how we could view that as a blessing. And is there any opportunity in the current situation? So for example, the detention center offered a lot of courses for them to, you know, to pick up some profession when they turn 18. And we kind of started off, you know, on that uh, uh, on that thought and uh, trying to see how they are still protected. They have roof over their head, they have food on the table. Uh, and it really worked. So the center asked me to come back. And every time I went back, I would get all these 20 little girls, you know, wanting to give me hugs and wanting to talk to me. And like, you know, this sort of like really waited. To, uh, for me to come and talk to them. So I thought, okay, that's, there's something here, like, you know, that I can uh, sort of uh, cultivate on. And at that time, I still thought of it as a, you know, one-off incident and one-off pleasant experience, um, but it taught me a lot. And after that, whenever I was forced to sort of do this kind of counseling, I would just do it. And there was a lot of, uh, like, you know, life provided me ample opportunities. So I continued with that sort of practice of like, you know, trying to uh, have somebody just think differently. i like, you know, look at the positives and what is it that they need to read to look at this? And when I was a student in London uh, doing my, I guess uh, it was after I finished my master's. So at that time also I had various opportunities because I was surrounded by people uh, who were like, you know, in their early 20s, and some of them were struggling to make sense of life. And I was studying, uh, my research that time was on the concept of happiness. 
And in the process, I was also looking at various different emotions, like emotion of anger and this and that. So a lot of my uh, friends and colleagues became my guinea pigs. And in the process, this, this just kept developing. Uh, it took me a very long time to understand that what I was doing was philosophical counseling. But every time I gave talks, you know, people would come to me and say like, could you help us? Because we want to, uh, you know, resolve our problem in a positive way. And uh, it seems like the philosophical text might have something to offer. Mm. So I kind of continued with that. Right. But there's a distinction, right, between positive psychology and philosophy, because not everything needs to be positive or positivized all the time, right? And Absolutely. it can have yeah. value for, for reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, there is this view that world philosophy is important, right? Not just um, learning from the usual uh, Western um, classics. And I completely agree with that. But then I think we go too far when we have this, in my view, condescending and paternalizing idea that you notice that every time we mention a tale or a story from another culture, it has to be beautiful and positive. Yeah. And, and I, uh, for example, let's take Rama and Sita, right? That story, um, I was working on it today, that's why. Uh, and it's very interesting. Um, so m most people will hear us might not know the story. I won't get into the details, but basically it's a story where uh, this Rama uh, is constantly challenged between what he would like for himself and the duties that he owes to his family or to the community and to the point that he's made to banish his own wife that he loves yeah. uh, uh, for the sake of what people think. Mm -hmm. And there's no way this story, or let's say there's no way what Rama did there is completely positive, right? Of course, mm -hmm. we can say, well, when in doubt, uh, you can try to follow the norms that are uh, established around you. But I think the real value of these stories is that they provide food for debate, right? Uh, how much of the self should be uh, independent or, or, or autonomous, if that ever is not an illusion, of course, and how much of the self should comply with a certain idea of values, virtue, but then is it the virtue of the collective, the pre-established virtue, or is it an ethics step? And then we can elaborate on that. So I think it's important for me to, to be on this perhaps dialectic or the thin line where we don't want to feel that we criticize all the time, right? There is this view of philosophy that's going to criticize all the time. Philosophy, I, I agree with you, as this tremendous power of making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, but I think we need to distinguish between positive psychology and this urge to always positivize everything. And, yeah, I, and, and, I'm with and, you on that because uh, the point is not to sort of like, you know, look at black and say it's white when it's not. So it's not like, you know, whitewash things as such. But I think most people want to study philosophy or want to read anything about philosophy only when they're completely stuck in a corner in life or they feel like, you know, they need to come out of this kind of judgmental thinking. Like they don't want to be judgy. They don't want to like, you know, sort of do something that they might regret later. Uh, but they want to have a new thought, a new perspective. And they want to see like, you know, is there a way to get out of it? So for example, you know, you brought up a very, very beautiful example of uh, King Rama abandoning his wife, Sita, whom he loved very much and for whom he had fought a big war. And at the end of it, like did he fight the war to uh, regain her in order to lose her again? And that doesn't make any sense, you know, especially if you're a woman growing in India, like you start wondering what was the whole point and you know, why would he do that? I mean, was he really a good king or a good husband? So all those 
you know, in that particular moment, for example, it was a very controversial moment. Or likewise, if you go to the Mahabharat, you know, where Arjun, uh, Prince Arjun is standing on the battlefield and he looks at his enemies whom he's supposed to kill and they're all his relatives. And he suddenly gets so overwhelmed that he says, I can't, I can't do this because these are the people who raised me, they taught me, and I can't, you know, uh, pick up the weapon against them. So it's these situations in life, you know, when you're confronted with choices and the choices don't seem good choices, like they're not easy choices. And then you, you know, turn to philosophy and then you wonder, like, what values am I going to use? What criteria I'm going to use uh, to justify whatever choice I make? Right. And we could say then that humanity at this moment is perhaps turning more to philosophy. I mean, we are uh, philosophical councils, we have always the feeling that, that more people are interested in philosophy. Maybe that's a bias, maybe they're not. But um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, the situation of the earth today clearly calls for some sort of a shared understanding or at least some sort of a conversation on a higher level that is not really happening. Uh, there is a lot of... Um, divide a lot of uh, wars of ideologies mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time one could say it's a little bit sad that people wait to be stuck in a corner to start deep thinking right it's yeah. true when we look at the fact that people can go about 10 20 30 years without really stopping and asking themselves what's my purpose in life yeah. And suddenly, out of the blue, uh, uh, they lose a dear one or someone leaves them or they lose their job. Or, and then they start um, thinking, right? And I think one of the lessons of philosophy is the anticipation, right? The, yeah. Uh, the um, thought experiments about things that are only possible, mm -hmm. which leads me to a very um interesting point but this is a sort of disguised and un under a question is what would really be your specialty if you define it is it business it is is it psychology is it philosophy is it a bit of everything well it's hard to answer because i had a very non-linear career in some ways um my my primary interest definitely lies in comparative philosophy. And, you know, my book is on comparative philosophy. And I have a copy of it just to, you know, show you what it looks like. Uh, so this is a study of uh, a wise person or the concept of a wise person uh, between Seneca Stoicism and the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, so I originally started with, you know, wanting to be a philosophy uh, teacher or something. And I was a lecturer at Pune University for three years. But after I moved to the US, you know, I realized that I needed to be able to work with analytical philosophy. And uh, I was not interested at that time. I can understand. Uh, I know it sounds, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of people who have the same problem as I do, but it's a very, very small number of people. Right. And you know, by now, I actually really appreciate anal analytical philosophy. Uh, but I felt like the kind of work I wanted to do, the kind of research I was doing, uh, it just wasn't possible to explain it in analytical way. Because in some ways, you know, analytical philosophy uh, provides us a lot of arguments and the arguments need to be defined or explained and, uh, and validated in terms of other arguments. But they don't leave any uh, you know, space open for any action, whether this can be put to practical use. Whereas I wanted to do research on something that is both, uh, you know, theoretical, but can also be practical. Uh, so anyway, so, um, so my research was not in analytical philosophy. And then I felt like, you know, okay, so I'm not going to get a job in academia. So I might as well try something else. So I went into the business sector and I worked for 10 years in US corporate industry. 
And then as the luck would have it, I stopped doing that. And then I turned to uh, philosophizing again. And then I was doing a lot of you know, volunteering work and I did some nonprofit work. And uh, I became the president of Princeton Research Forum for a few years. And it's an organization of independent research scholars. Uh, but throughout this time, there was one continu continuity uh, in my life, which was the philosophical counseling. And for some reason, like I just kept getting, you know, people to come to me and ask me. And I guess I always talked about, you know, my passion for philosophy. Uh, so it was very interesting that, you know, I never thought of uh, philosophical counseling as a way to as a profession, kind of, but as a way to give back to the community and to help, you know, anybody who might be stuck in uh, any situation. And then my volunteering work provided me a lot of those opportunities. And I started thinking, you no, know, it has to be something more serious than just like, you know, sort of having those conversations. Uh, so that was the time that I came across uh, Apple uh, and, you know, the work of, uh, uh, Professor Lou Marinov and I uh, joined them and then it became very sort of uh, uh, more of an enterprise as such. Um, but I can tell you some of my uh, clients sort of like, you know, come from um, come from this area where like, um, where they were like seriously in, in situations which required emergency actions. Uh, and then they really needed to think like, you know, are they going to make choices which are going to be life threatening or are they going to make choices which they could sort of like, you know, come to term with, terms with even 10 years later. And um, sometimes it became very difficult to work with such clients. Um, but once the emergency passed, then they were very open reading philosophical texts and uh, they would read either a strike text or the Bhagavad Gita. And that's when I got my um, book published because I felt like, you know, I need to uh, make the knowledge uh, very trans, uh, transient in the sense like I wanted to give it to them uh, saying that these are the concepts that I'm working with. It's not something that I'm just coming up, you know, uh, coming up with at this part of the moment. Mm. Uh, so to give you an idea, like, you know, there was one uh, case I saw which was really inspirational for me. Uh, this person was not my client, but I was working with the emergency medical services and we went to help somebody who was trying to um, basically kill herself uh, by taking an overdose of drugs. And uh, maybe she didn't consciously think that she was going to kill herself, but uh, she was like, you know, in a really bad state when we went there, she was unconscious and uh, we needed to call the medics to revive her. But when she improved, and uh, thankfully she improved uh, with some, you know, sort of uh, inst uh, sort of emergency level medication, uh, it turned out that her problem was that she had lost her job. And she was a single mom. She had a daughter, and she wasn't sure how she was going to deal with the situation. And it felt like but philosophy would have helped, you know, if she had the understanding that ups and downs in life are very common. And if you just, you know, think about how life could give you uh, different opportunities or, you know, it's possible to just uh, stay strong and let this pass and then worry more about the daughter who she was responsible for than about the fact that, you know, they might not be able to support their lifestyle. Mm. So philosophy kind of teaches you to, you know, uh, we things which are seriously important and not worry about things which are less important. So it's that kind of, you know, that kind of sense of detachment one needs to develop can only come through philosophical thinking or reflection or understanding. Mm. Well, there's, so, this is very uh, good because there's good transition to the question that was um sort of attached to my, or, or more the comment that was attached to my question, uh, which is the following. People have sometimes a hard time distinguishing between uh, philosophical sense and willpower. And I think uh, it's very important to distinguish, otherwise uh, psychology uh, would do the trick. 
the fact is that um, philosophy brings a, um, a, as you know, a way of thinking that is structuring. So that is the long term, right? What what mm -hmm. has been called by by some um, thinking slow, right? And it has been showed actually by psychologists. So by all means, I don't mean to pretend that there's a war because, between psychology and philosophy. I think there's a lot of uh, results in psychology that show the importance mm -hmm. of philosophical health, for example, or the science of purpose. And so what we know is that the brain uh, is very bad at dealing metacognitively in a rational manner with matters at stake in the here and now, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the brain is constantly triggered by emotions, uh, stimuli that it reacts to usually in the fast mode, which is the instinctual mode, which is the reptilian brain, et cetera. And that no, I mean, you need to be a really a god to, to, to control that if you have no structuring system mm -hmm. so what philosophy in a way is always trying to do is is sort of transform the brain into a structuring machine and that is done through uh repetitive training of higher values uh mm -hmm. system of thought etc which is the the slow thinker and it has been showed that actually uh there can be we cannot self-program it through will, right? Like if I have no reason why to stop eating chocolate, I will just continue eating chocolate yes. all my life. There's no way out of it. However, if I have a long-term model right. that sort of has as a consequence that that I should eat butterflies instead of chocolate, it's just a metaphor, but uh, this will work better let's say we 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 not it never reaches 100 but so yeah. my experience and i've always i've also dealt with people who are suicidal um etc i usually um, um bang them on the head with a, a version of plato's republic no just kidding but <laughs> what i've seen is that it's true that people who are more let's say emotional more governed yeah. their emotions they yeah. are going to be more hard to do philosophical counseling with precisely because their brain is not used to the long-term mode, to the structuring mode. They are most of the time in a triggering mode, right? Yeah. And we yeah. also know that there are moments uh, of our life or even ways our organisms are built, um, depending on the fact if we're a woman or a man or, or a fish or whatever, that has different kind of uh, an, an ecology, uh, physiological dependence. So, is so the question is: Is philosophical health really for everybody? Um, in the long term, perhaps, right? But with a lot of mm -hmm. education. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. I see you want to go. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's a question I've wanted to offer for some time. And uh, okay, so my my answer might be more generic, but I think the answer is yes, absolutely. So the way I look at it is that if you look at the entire range of spectrum of what kinds of individuals there are, uh, so if you look at very emotional people and they're triggered, do you think they enjoy being triggered? They don't, you know, because it's a lot of ups and downs for them. So. You kind of have to help them, like, you know, come to some kind of a balance. But when they're in the state of balance, they're open to reading uh, philosophical material or open to discussing their thoughts and open to discussing if another reaction was a possibility for them at that particular moment of crisis. So they can still benefit from that. And what happens is that, like, you know, in a way, I feel like there's no, uh, there's no conflict between philosophy and psychology, and we can create a structure, a society, uh, which is so healthy, or at least you know stronger 
uh, in a way that they don't fall into, you know, sort of mental illness or like crazy situations like being suicidal or something like that. And we don't know whether we'll be suicidal at some point in life because we don't know what kind of curveballs that, you know, life is going to throw at us. But the question is, can we prepare ourselves in advance so that when there's the crisis, you know, in the next uh, um, 10 years or 20 years, you know, are we able to deal with that? So that's like, you know, for one kind of uh, uh, sort of category. Uh, most people who are sort of mainstream, you know, have emotional reactions some of the times and some of the times they're more analytical and they can also benefit by like, you know, just doing some kind of reflection about who they are. And if I just sit here and think, who am, who am I? You know, I might think I'm a princess. I might think I'm a beggar. I might think like, you know, I'm a nobody or everybody. I mean, the options are, you know, just uh, amazing, enormous. Uh, so the question is, you only figure out, or at least this is my own thinking, I could be wrong about it, but I think you only figure out when you're in a situation and then you kind of observe how you're reacting or how you want to resolve that situation. Until then, you don't really know, like, you know, uh, what's going to happen when, uh, when sort of like, you know, you actually have to produce something or when you are in a crisis. So that's one thing. And then there are people who are extremely analytical and they sort of, you know, lack uh, the balance of uh, analytical brain and the emotional brain. And they could also benefit by knowing that, you know, there's another uh, option available of like, you know, understanding themselves or the emotions by reflecting upon that. So, so I really think that philosophy or philosophizing is possible for absolutely everyone. Right. So I think it's it's interesting. You criticized earlier analytic philosophy, and I and I and right now you made a point. It's it's true that it's. I think it's important to uh, dissociate philosophical health from analytic thinking right uh, mm -hmm. analytic thinking you divide the real into parts that you know it's mm -hmm. not very creative it, it it's very useful uh, to sort of understand the situation from different perspectives mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean you're gonna you're not going to fall into the same traps because uh, in a way it's it's uh, quite contingent to the mm -hmm. situation at stake that's mm -hmm. the first thing. Secondly, it's usually deterministic. So historically, as you know, analytic thinking is deterministic in the way it's going to say, okay, there's everything is determined by causes and events. And basically, if you apply that to life, you end up with, with the idea that we have a pre-written destiny. Uh, then mm -hmm. for people who are more into uh tensions and and relationships and or relations between mm -hmm. uh, different situations then that's the dialectic thinking more uh in in the Hegelian terms this tension of opposites and there's a problem mm -hmm. again because this often ends up in because our our again the creative capacity is limited uh so we tend to see the world as op binary opposites, right? So me mm -hmm. against my husband, um, uh, me against my job, etc. Right, and and so the um, I think there is a third mode of thinking that is actually connected with uh, philosophical thinking, which I call creolectic, mm -hmm. uh, which means that it's it's not deterministic, as you were suggesting mm -hmm. yourself. There are always options and they are infinite, in fact. Of course, confronted to reality, we might want to see a set of options, not infinite, right? But still, um, at the source of things, there is this infinite possibility, which is creative, which is non-deterministic. Uh, the world is not predictable, if you take it as mm -hmm. a whole. And, mm -hmm. and so I think it's important to explain to people that and I think that's a gateway through uh, sort of uh, democratizing philosophical health, which is the relation mm -hmm. to the spiritual, right? So mm -hmm. a philosophical counseling is always a bit stuck between these two 
the psychological field and yeah. the spiritual field, right? And yeah. I think there's a little bit of both. Yeah. Of course, there is a relationship to higher powers or at least a higher purpose or, or that is very important uh, for the way we conduct our lives because if we are very analytic and don't believe in anything, we will, as you were suggesting, uh, end up uh, in uh, some trouble. However, it's not this sort of um, element of faith or or leap of faith that is that is important for for some long term uh, purposeful thinking. Mm-hmm. It's not akin to a religion in the sense that I think. And I will stop here, but I think there's a fundamental thread going on in the history of philosophy that is usually not very emphasized, is that since Plato, I was talking about the Republic, which I don't use as, as a weapon, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or at least not physically, uh, is, is the idea that there can be paradise on earth. Hmm. And that's the difference with religions. Most religions say paradise is not here and now, can't be. It's in a remote place, either after we die or in a cave, but not, and which is, can be quite convincing when we look at our fellow humans and how uh, chaotic they can be. But I think philosophy has been over and over attempting to say, no, we can make this world a better place, which is exactly what you're saying so in that sense i think this is what you mean by uh the positive right it is mm-hmm. the the idea that uh we can we can't contribute to a better harmony here mm-hmm. i mean it's going to take some time right it's perhaps indefinite in time but yeah. nevertheless yeah. it's imminent but yeah. i find beautiful I'm... yeah go ahead yeah, no, I do mean to interrupt. Uh, but it's like, you know, the, it also depends on what the idea of paradise is. Like, for example, uh, you know, my work is on the concept of wise person who is supposed to be very happy and like, you know, uh, they are supposed to be in complete uh, harmony and in balance and, you know, they have the good balance of uh, being uh, sort of having the right kinds of judgments, the right kinds of virtues and the right ideas about, you know, um, happiness. Like they are not expecting to sort of get excited about getting a million dollar lottery every day, or they are not expecting to, you know, lose everything they have just the next day. So they're sort of like, you know, in between in a balanced kind of stage. Um, I remember when I used to uh, do this therapy with all my uh, friends in our early twenties, Everybody had a completely different idea about what happiness was. And then I came across this uh, text from Stoics and text from the Gita, which I'd heard about in my childhood. And I said, it doesn't make any sense because all of us want to go on the beach, eat ice cream, and like, you know, just uh, have a great time. And that's our idea of happiness. So when you come to the philosophers, it really doesn't make any sense in your 20s or in your early life. Um, but then you start seeing the wisdom, because if you apply the uh, conventional criteria of happiness, uh, they're very short term, they're very temporary, and that just doesn't continue. Like, you know, as you said, chocolate is something fun, you can have it, but if you have it the whole day, you're going to be very sick the next day. So then is it worth being happy one day and being, to- being totally sick the next day? Or is it worth having a balance, you know, in eating maybe um, you know, a bit of chocolate uh, in a day and saving the rest for the remaining days or something of the kind. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a lot like that. So depending on, you know, how you define paradise, um, you can have it, but it's, it takes work. It's not easy. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that it's going to be very hard to find a philosopher that says that paradise is eating ice cream <laughs> yeah. at the beach. Um, but I think you, you mentioned two words that I think are connected to what you just said. You mentioned, uh, serendipity and you mentioned also, um, more an idea than a word, the calling, the fact that, um, in your life, it looks like people want you to, 
to be a philosophical counselor without you over trying that. And yeah. I think this brings a nice contrast to the idea that people might have when they listen to us that uh, philosophical health is about planning, like, you know, having this 30 years plan and having always this long view. There is an idea of that, but in my view, it's not an analytical plan. It's more an admiration for certain virtues, values, ideas. Uh, and then it's sort of a repeated practice of, of meditation on those. But then in relationship to the more mundane events of life, that allows for more openness. Uh, so it's exactly what the sense of purpose does. And people, uh, young people that I uh, do uh, counseling with um, are usually, they make usually they, this mistake between goal and purpose, right? So they would say, oh, my purpose is to become a doctor. That's not a purpose. Of course, that's just one goal, which can be a strategy. But there are many purposes for which one might want to become a doctor, making money, for example. Is it a good purpose? I don't think so. Uh, but so, and people find it hard to understand that a purpose is usually something that is transcendent. And precisely mm -hmm. because it's transcendent, it can be very precise and repeated, leaving place for what you said about serendipity, the uh, you know uh, encounters of of destiny, because it sort of creates a a field, an epistemic field that mm -hmm. uh, tends to filter perhaps what what. Uh, what you let happen to you and and not and um and it's true that when we're young you were mentioning we don't understand the science because we don't have that the glasses the the that filter that would allow us to listen to what's mm -hmm. going on yeah. around us right and then uh, 10 years later oh actually that's what it meant yeah. <laughs> i should have done that right <laughs> So what philosophical professors yeah. are saying is that, well, in a way, it's like, you know, we now we are quite old. Uh, maybe we are in our 50s and we've done those mistakes. Maybe we can help you see yeah. earlier in life what is yeah. doing and not. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was really interesting. And, you know, for me, like, even uh, my personal journey was a little bit like that. I, I wrote my uh, book in my uh, youth as a sort of, you know, PhD student. And uh, I thought it was a nice topic to work on, but I never thought that this was actually applicable in life. And then it took me a long time because every time I would, you know, talk to my family about my problems in life, they would say, just read your book, read your book. And mm -hmm. I said, what's that supposed to mean? Um, but yeah, I mean, there were also a lot of moments, you know, moments of crisis or moments of decision making. And then I felt very compelled to go back to these concepts. And, uh, you know, I would go back several times to the Gita and to um, strikes. And, uh, and coming to your point about like, you know, the purpose of life and the spirituality or the spiritual philosophy. I think that's one field that still remains, you know, unexplored in some ways, even though um, you know, everybody has been talking about meditation or, you know, related concepts uh, from Buddhism, Hinduism. Um, I don't think we have quite explored spiritual philosophy as such and its connection with, uh, you know, philosophical health. So my current research is on that. And I've been like, you know, studying the medieval saints from different parts of India uh, to see like, you know, what are the, uh, what are the tenets in Hinduism? Uh, that are sort of like, you know, uh, that are applicable, that can be brought to life uh, in different ways. And uh, one of my, um, one of my sort of counselees, so to say, uh, was uh, was an ideal counselee that uh, any philosophical counsellor would like to have. And uh, the question that this person had was, uh, okay, so I lived all my life in the Western world. I have been brought up on Sartre but I want to have the results of the Vedanta. So how do I make the journey from Sartre to Vedanta? 
So I said, you can't have, like, you know, the Satrian philosophy to produce uh, non Satrian results. So if you want Vedantic results, you have to practice the Vedanta philosophy and for a very long time. And I think it was just a beautiful uh, conversation and multiple conversations um, talking to this person because, you know, we were talking sort of theoretically, but, but there's absolutely the positive, uh, well, not the positive, but there was, there was a result that was awaited, like, you know, how the life is going to be, uh, what are the important things about life and what do we need to do? Uh, you know, how do we conduct ourselves? Uh, so, so they are all sort of, you know, related back to uh, the theory that we discussed initially about uh, Rama and Sita. Rama was confronted with making a choice about what is his duty and what duty is uh, more important or primary. His duty as a king or his duty as a husband. So those are all the choices that one has to make, right? And one also has to live with those choices. Like we have to be able to accept ourselves making those choices right and and uh you you had me uh, i started uh uh working on the relationship between nothingness in sartre and nothingness <laughs> in the time, but that would be for another uh, yeah, you see what I mean. dialogue i think we we're going to wrap up um mm -hmm. what would you consider to be the most important element of philosophical health based on your experience? Well, I mean, well-being, I think, is the most important. And uh, for different people, well-being, you know, uh, can be reached in different ways. Uh, so as long as you have some idea about how to accept life as it is, because life and well-being are, I think, the most important things. Uh, so depending on depending on the kind of uh, person you are, like the kind of makeup you have. Um, you just need to come to the balance. And once you're at the balance, it's also still an effort to maintain that balance. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, that's, um, we, we, we still have just a few minutes, but that makes me think that people, uh, because of the influence of psychotherapy, People might think that uh, people come to philosophical health always with complaints, right? Uh, with problems, with suffering, uh, which is in a way sort of true. But you can have, you can also realize that things are going too well. There's too much well-being in your life, yeah. but not of the right kind, right? So. A redefinition of well-being. Uh, I had I had this beautiful story of a um, a lady who came to me one day and she said, "Well, I am too joyful because as long as I am alone with myself, it's great. I am pure joy. But every time I am in relationship with the other, whether close relationship or." Then I get a little bit sad because the other is not as joyful as me. So I have always to sort of adapt, go down. Um, and and I, I found that very interesting because I think it is in human nature also to always want more, right? So some people are going to tell you, oh, well-being is boring, is bourgeois. I want adventure. I want to feel possibility. And... And to this, I think philosophy always answers uh, historically. Uh, I don't know much about the Indian tradition. You're going to tell me about that. But in the ancient uh, Western tradition, there is this idea of apotheosis, of theosis, of becoming godlike. And mm -hmm. we don't talk too much about that because it's sort of taboo. But um, uh, if I right, put it yeah. in, yeah, it's sort of taboo to say, oh, I can yeah. become a god. But yeah. a lot of philosophers thought that, of course, it's not in, in the sense of a superhero. We're not going to start to fly, yeah. but yeah. we're going to start to fly with our minds. So if you yeah. take Plato, Plotinus, etc., yeah. uh, there is this idea that 
it becomes an adventure also because we sort of uh, become more than human. And this might satisfy, I would say, um, the um, the need for some people to to, which I think it's it's understandable, the need for adventure, right? So philosophy is not only about the Stoics who, you know, take their pain and accept all the humiliations with a smile and and are apolitical and a little bit masochistic. No. Being philosophical healthy, there are many ways of being philosophical yeah. healthy. One of them can be very um, exuberant. Why not? If it fits your character. Is there mm -hmm. a, a in the traditional Indian um, philosophical way, is there an idea that of, of becoming godlike or is it is it something else? Luis, I don't know how to start this. Okay. Yes. So is uh, sorry. Do you mind just repeating your question? Yes. Uh, is there in the Indian tradition a also a uh, a calling to, uh, you know, uh, what, what the overman or this sort of a I'm using a, a controversial Nietzsche's concept here, but sort of the, to becoming a bit more divine as Plato or Plotinus or, or even Aristotle. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, uh, you know, there's definitely this concept in Plato and uh, you find this concept in the Vedantic philosophy and in, uh, in the Upanishads um, or even in the Gita. Like, you know, the wise person eventually uh, has a, a spiritual depth and the divine nature and they get to that point and how do they get to that point so by you know doing meditation and by becoming one with the brahman as the vedanta would tell you uh, so the same concept uh, exists even in stoicism if you look at it very carefully but their idea of divine is somewhat different so right. for them divine is sort of you know ethical or moral person who is as perfect as a human being can be. Um, but the perfection in the Vedantic philosophy is really sort of, you know, becoming one with the Brahman. And uh, it goes to the point that the person has uh, um, has an understanding of the world. I mean, I don't want to call it superhuman powers or something, because that doesn't quite happen that way. But they have the understanding of the world, which is so far superior and so fine compared to any of us. Uh, that you know they are sort of like the fountain of wisdom themselves. Right. No, I think it's a beautiful point to conclude that uh, oneness. Um, and I want to thank you very much for this um, wonderful cl clarification and conversation about. Well, thank you so uh, for for your invitation. You're welcome. So. Um,